I'm Jeff Moses from Columbia, and to my left is, uh, is Hermann Reichensperner from, uh, from Eppendorf in uh, Germany. And we have, uh, I think, a, a great session ahead with some uh, real, now we're in the meat of at least my home, my, my home base, clinical, clinical medicine. Um, and we're going to start off, I think, which will be an interesting and provocative lecture uh, by my good friend Elazar Elaz, uh, Edelman from uh, Harvard MIT program. Oh, there Thank you very much, Jeff, and, and um, to all the organizers. What I'm actually going to talk about is, is truly uh, a collaboration between our laboratories at MIT, Harvard, and the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Abiomed, and therefore I've listed as authors on this talk, if you will, our Abiomed collaborators. We've been talking about left ventricular assist devices as therapeutic tools, but they're quite fascinating because they reside in the very ventricle that we're trying to determine its function. And therefore, what we've looked at is the LVADs as diagnostic tools. The impella is the paragmatic support device, not only because it resides directly in the left ventricle, because in addition, it is relatively non-disruptive. You don't have to core out any part of the myocardium. Moreover, its very design allows you to extract a significant amount of information, and I'll talk about that in a minute. This is the... Um, aortic and left ventricular pressures that sweep across uh, over a very large number of uh, cardiac cycles. But what's interesting is that the impella, every beat, beat to beat, maintains its rotor speed, its constant, by changing the amount of current that it's fed to the rotor. And so in addition to this sweep across of aortic and left ventricular pressures, you see in yellow here, superimposed the motor current that is being fed to the left ventricle. Now, when I highlight this at sort of slow, at a, a faster sweep speed, you see the aortic pressure, you see left ventricular pressure, you see that there's some natu natural respiratory variation, but what happens is the speed of the impella stays constant, but the motor current undergoes subtle variation. In every single beat, in order to maintain that speed as constant, the first thing that's happening is that the impella is sensing something in the ventricle, and it's changing its speed. And so what we and, and our colleagues reasoned was that we could use the amount of motor current that was being fed and the pressure head because that's what you actually measure, and extract a variety of left ventricular metrics right from the indwelling device. Think about this for a minute. When you put your car on cruise control, you put it at 60, 65, or you're on the Autobahn, 100, 120, 150, whatever it is, it's always the same speed, but the amount of fuel that's concerned, the amount of current that's supplied varies going up or down depending upon whether you're on a high demand or low demand slope. Same thing happens to the impella. Now, it does so in a nonlinear way, and this is what makes it non-obvious, and this is why the MIT part of me, the part of me that knows enough that in the presence of brilliant students to cover my mouth and never say anything but nod my head, because I said to them, well, let's just look at the relationship between the pressure head and the motor current. And they said, yes, but it is asymmetric. It is nonlinear. It changes with the cardiac cycle. And what you see here in blue is contraction. You see in brown, relaxation. You see in yellow, filling. But every single pump actually always has the same hysteresis loop. In fact, you can always extract left ventricular end diastolic pressure. You can always extract peak pressure. You can extract the slope of uh, relaxation and the slope of contraction. But you have to be an MIT student to derive the fifth order polynomial equation that will, when you use spline trigonometry, allow you to place these all together. 
And if you're like me, you just nod when someone tells you that. <laughs> now, what we did in a series of experiments, again, with the Abiomed collaborators first in a mock control loop, then in animals, and more recently in humans, is actually validate these things. We, in the animal models, are able to keep contractility, and in the flow loops, keep contractility the same and very left ventricular end diastolic pressure. And you see that in these loops, you can actually extract left ventricular end diastolic pressure. Similarly, you can keep preload constant and vary contractility by giving inotropic agents, or as has been discussed, we can actually induce various stages of myocardial ischemia or in frank myocardial infarctions. And we can use these loops to extract both what the left ventricular end diastolic pressure and the contractility measurements are. Here's the algorithm. We're going to call it an algorithm because our hope is that soon this is going to be placed inside the next generation of Impella devices. Next Impella generations will not just be open loop devices. They will be devices much like the ventilators we use, which actually sense volume, pressure, compliance, altering things on a breath-to-breath -breath and beat-to-beat -beat basis. So we'll detect the rotor speed and the current. We'll pull up the proper pressure motor head curves that are unique for each device and characterized and fed into the machine. And from that, we can define the pressure in the left ventricle and end diastole. Now we compared this in animals and in humans to what happens when you use the prototypical pulmonary artery swan gans device. Now recall where that's sitting. It's actually quite important. It's sitting in a pulmonary artery. Irrespective of what the compliance of the pulmonary artery, what the left atrium is, we're measuring left ventricular end diastolic pressure from an inference of what happens in the pulmonary artery. And so what you see here in the stars are pulmonary artery pulmonary capillary wedge pressures. What you see here in the black line is a direct measure from either the pressure volume loops, you ask for pressure volume loops, we're going to show them to you, or catheters residing directly in the left ventricle. And you see that in general, there's an almost six millimeter of mercury error in the measurement. Now in this dotted blue line is what that algorithm detects. It has an error of less than one millimeter of mercury and then spanning from very low, less than five, to very high, over 25 millimeters of mercury, you see, and I won't show you the Bland-Altman plot, how extraordinarily true these measurements can be made in multiple, multiple different animal models. I actually used this in one of my patients. I asked patient, we, one thing we've learned is intervene early, intervene often. It's like voting in uh, certain states in the United States. <laughs> you like that, Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> so here's a breath hold from one of my patients who got an impeller early, and therefore I could actually talk to him. <laughs> and uh, I said, hold your breath. And so his, the, the, the pulmonary artery catheter, as you see here, is actually not varying tremendously, and the algorithm tracks dramatically. There is respiratory variation, but the wedge pressure as reported in the chart and as measured misses all of this. This is something that we can therefore measure in patients, in animals, in mock flow loops. We can integrate into the future of left ventricular assist devices, and in particular the impella, and the day will come very soon, because we've been working on this, as I'm sure others have as well, when we can make advanced metrics well beyond left ventricular end diastolic pressure. It's going to help us as clinicians. It's going to help us as patients. It's going to help us to avoid using a technology that I embraced as a cardiology fellow, but now hardly ever used, the pulmonary artery catheter. It allows us, I believe, to enter into a domain that we can move away from having multiple, multiple devices, multiple, multiple catheters to having the one catheter residing in the left ventricle and telling us everything. And so with that, I'll close simply by thanking first the organizers for the opportunity to present this, second, Abiomed 
for the incredible opportunity to work on this very exciting project, and third, for my colleagues who did absolutely all of the work and allowed me to come to Barcelona and look out this window. Yeah, thank you very much for this exciting talk. I mean, we'll uh, have a panel discussion, but uh, if there are any urgent questions, we have a minute. Uh, uh, if somebody, if I would see something, I should put my glasses on. Patrick. <laughs> thanks, for this okay. great, thanks for this great presentation. Uh, it's always good to see that the measurement works in principle, and then the next question is, are there major confounding factors that uh, we should expect or fear, or do you think there are things which might invalidate this measurement in specific patients, in specific situations? So I, I just want to make sure I heard because there's tremendous echo here. You asked me whether there are confounding factors to these measurements. I'm sure there are. I mean, there have to be. And there's no such thing as perfect. There's no such thing as, uh, as something that, that works in every patient. We, we found that this is substantially better at returning left ventricular end diastolic pressure, but not just left ventricular end diastolic pressure, multiple indices of left ventricular function. I'm only showing you one, right? So if, if all we could measure was left ventricular and diastolic pressure, there are other ways to do this. We can measure those slopes to give us contractility. We can measure the other slope to give us relaxation. We can tell filling. We can tell power. We can measure cardiac output. We can measure stroke volume. All that will come, and I hope to be able to present that next year. Now, what about the confounding factors? I haven't discovered them yet, but I'm sure that they exist. Um, any thoughts you, who are an expert in this domain, would have, I would love to hear. Uh, well, certainly the question of suction problems with the motor, which invalidate such curves. Can this be uh, detected, circumvented, corrected? So certainly if, if there is suction, right, you're going to have a problem. But suction is at markedly low ventricular volumes. The significance here is that you're actually making a uh, uh, a measurement which is relatively direct, right, as opposed to inferred at a distance. And when there's suction, I mean, that's something that you need to deal with. It's an unstable condition that needs to be dealt with rather acutely. But the advantage is that the machine is also, at, also actually telling you there's suction. What I'm presenting is not a novel way of measuring left ventricular end diastolic pressure. What I'm presenting is the idea that ultimately, just as we will wean our patients off inotropes, I think the day will come where we'll remove all of the lines from the patient and use the catheter itself as virtually the only indwelling device to sense everything from suction to preload to afterload to aortic left ventricular pressure and all of those functions. Elazar, yes, dear. Is, uh, the, the, there is no doubt that you have a lot of information that you derived from the, the current of the device as you just showed. But there is two, two questions here. You assume that the PA, the PA diastolic or whatever is uh, correlate with the LVDP here. And uh, there we know that in heart failure, and specifically in acute heart failure, there is a decoupling process between the two. So the PA diastolic and the LVDP are separated, or what we know is the coupling between the PA diastolic and the wedge. The question how you take into account here in your calibration when you calibrate the system based on this algorithm. So I, I'm sorry, I'm missing something here. Why do you say I'm assuming anything about the PAD? Because you said that you have the catheter in the, uh, in the PA diastolic when you did before you started the calibration. No, no, the, cal the, 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 the calibration is that these are calibrated in the uh, factory, that that relationship, the motor current, the hysteresis loop, is a unique function of each motor. It's something that's built into the device. Devices will always behave the same way. It has nothing to do with the pulmonary artery pressure. It's the preload eventually. Well, n no. The, the, well, it's dependent on preload, but it's independent of you can't base it on the, the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure. I, I agree. That, that's my concern. But, the, but this, has, this calibration is agnostic to that, and that's why it's good. It's, if it's a completely yeah. agnostic, yeah. so it's good. What's that? Calibrating a transducer. 
Exactly. Yeah. Okay, we have one last question from the floor. Elazar, that's a really brilliant work. Uh, my question is somewhat related, but what do you attribute the difference between your wedge and, and LVDP to? Is it a fidelity measurement with a wedge? Is it something about the pump that leads to this difference in pressure measurement or unloading of the LV? So I, I want to be careful. You know, I think I, I knew both, you know, Willie Gans, I trained with Peter, and Swan's daughter. But I think that catheter has come and gone. And I think there are tremendous issues with using that catheter it, in when everything is perfect, when the patient is completely still, when you're at the precise time of the respiratory cycle, you actually get a correlation between true left ventricular and diastolic pressure and the wedge pressure. But it assumes that there's no pressure drop, there's no energy loss at any point from your measurement in the left ventricle to the pulmonary capillary, which to me doesn't make any sense and I think has been proved over and over again. Now, I could wave my hands. I don't think one could ever fully definitively explain why they depart or diverge, but I, I think that, that, that multiple people much more smart than I have uh, shown that to be the case. Have I answered your question, Ryan? I mean, I want to make sure that... <laughs> well, so I, th I think you said that you believe it's more of a fidelity m measurement issue with the wedge rather than anything about unloading the LV or use of the pump or attributed respiratory variation that that might cause that, that contributes to this. So I, I, I hope I didn't say that. I, I think there's something fundamentally not flawed but limited and restricted about using pulmonary artery wedge pressure. And it has to do with all the issues you and other people have examined. Okay, we have to, we have to move on. Thank you very much for this comment and for the talk. <laughs>